Good afternoon and welcome to another score sheet podcast. Today I'd like to talk about fielding in score sheet, both how your fielders' ranges affect your pitchers and also how we come up with those ranges. To start, we do give ranges to every score sheet fielder. The higher the number, the more balls they get to in the course of a nine inning game. For instance, if you have a third baseman with a 2.7 range compared to a third baseman with a 2.60 range, the third baseman with a 2.70 range will get to one tenth of a ball more per game. Now that doesn't sound like very much, but over 150 games, that's an extra 15 hits that 2.70 range third baseman has taken away compared to a 2.60 range third baseman. So that higher range player has saved your pitching staff 15 hits over the course of a season. You know, 15 hits for a full-time player is pretty much equivalent to 25 points in batting average. So while a fielding range doesn't affect that player's batting average, the way I like to think about it when I compare two players is in terms of batting average. So that higher range third baseman, if he hits 270 for the year, and the player with the 2.60 range hits 295 for the year, they're going to have about the same effect on your team because those extra 25 points in batting average the lousy fielder got you are going to be offset by the extra 25 points in batting average worth that your pitchers have been saved because the 15 hits that your pitchers have been saved, for instance. And so, like I said, even though a tenth of a hit per game sounds very small, the difference between a 270 and a 300 hitter in baseball is also pretty small spread over a full season. Fielding range... It's definitely one of those things that when you're drafting players, at least you can count on the good fielders doing that all year long. So I'm not suggesting that you know you want to make your first pick some light-hitting shortstop just because he has a good fielding range. But if two players, if you think they're going to hit anywhere near the same over the course of the year, you certainly do want to pay attention to fielding range. Also, if you notice your pitchers and score sheet are consistently giving up more hits and runs than they are in real life, more than they are even after accounting for the fact you're facing probably better hitters overall in real life, then you should look at your team's fielding range. Each week when we send out the game reports, at the bottom of each game score sheet, there's a line called fielding range bonus. Plus numbers are good. That means you have above average range. Negative numbers are bad. So if you notice you're consistently having a negative fielding range bonus and you've got some good fielders on the bench or some extra players you can trade away to get some better fielders, you might consider doing so. Even if you're not going to make trades or change your starting lineup, we do have defensive subs, a defensive subsection on the lineup guard. Certainly a light-hitting but really good-fielding player that's on your team that you may want to start, you should at least list him as a defensive sub and try to take away a hit or two late in the game when it really matters. We also get questions about how we figure out ranges for players. On the player list that we form in the preseason, we have lots of stats. We use the fielding stats from the last two years to determine rages. We use um, players' real-life number of balls that he gets to per nine innings played in the majors from the last two years. We also get a zone number from Stats Incorporated that shows how many balls that are hit in their zone they got to, what percentage of balls that are hit near them they actually fielded. Then we also adjust those statistics by the ground ball to fly ball ratios of their real-life pitching staff and also the strikeout numbers their real-life pitching staff put up. And then finally, we also put in some park effects. Um, obviously, if a guy plays on a team that strikes out a lot of players, there just aren't going to be as many balls to get to. So we adjust his fielding range numbers a little upward for that, for instance. And then, like I said, we use a player's last two years fielding numbers to come up with those ranges that are on the preseason player list. And then once we establish those, that's the range they use all year long. There really aren't nearly enough fielding numbers in a week for us to change fielding ranges every week. Determining the fielding ranges during the season when a player qualifies in a new position is a little trickier since often he's never played that position or at least hasn't played it very much in the majors. If a player played 20 games in a position last year in the majors, then he automatically qualifies there. But if he didn't play any, say, second base last year at all, and then this year he finally gets into some games at second and we qualify him, we, we have to come up with a range somehow. So we base the range on for people that qualify during the season on the positions they're listed at in the player list. So if they qualify at, say, shortstop and outfield, 
we'll consider a shortstop since that's a tougher fielding position and then kind of scale their range at shortstop to what the range at their new position would be. Players qualify during the season a new position once they reach 10 games played there in the major leagues. So if you're wondering when one of your guys is going to qualify at third base, you can go on one of the sites on the web, such as Rotowire or whatever, see how many games they played there and see if they're getting near to qualifying somewhere you might need them a little more. If they qualify during the week, then we qualify before we play that week's game. So in essence, they get qualified retroactively back to the start of the week. We do talk about fielding quite a bit on our website and our rules packet and now on this podcast, and I don't mean to imply that it's as important as pitching or hitting. I think most people in the major associated with major league teams would say fielding is maybe 10% of the game, and I'd say it's around there in the score sheet. You probably wouldn't trade Roy Holiday for a player that just because of his fielding abilities, but as I said earlier, if two players are anywhere similar in hitting abilities then the differences in their fielding abilities can really make one more or less valuable than the other. We hope this talk about fielding has helped answer some questions that we receive quite often. And maybe it'll eke out another win or two for your team during the season and put you over the top in that race for the playoffs. Thanks.